racial inequities, economic disparities, climate change, and other social injustices. How do we solve these issues that plague society? Well, the answer is simple. It's we go back to Jesus Christ. At least that's largely Rain Wilson's arguments, and obviously I'm oversimplifying it, but I'll get deeper into the book itself later on. Rain Wilson obviously got popular from playing Dwight on The Office, which I've never seen, but I know it's tremendously popular and I've heard great things about it, but I just haven't had the chance to see it. Um, I have seen him in a few things, like he played one of the characters in a movie called Super that I believe was directed by James Gunn. I remember liking it quite a bit. And also he did a pretty good job as um, one of the characters in the recent Weird Al Yankovic spoof movie. Rain Wilson seems like a pretty nice guy. I have heard him say things that I, uh, that I disagree with, but for the most part, he doesn't come across as a grifter, as many other people do. He seems like a genuine guy who, who believes these things and is passionate about them, even if I vehemently disagree with him. And I want to say something clear up front, because I know this is going to matter to some people, but I'm very clearly not the target demographic of this book. I do enjoy reading a lot of books on religious apologetics, whether we're talking about Eric Metaxas or William Lane Craig. And from what I've seen from the books that I've read and from the people whom I've listened to argue in defense of a particular religion or just in general the existence of God, is that their arguments can usually be placed into two camps. In one camp, you have people arguing for the existence of God, the, the actual existence of God, uh, epistemologically, ontologically, metaphysically, whatever. They're arguing for the actual genuine existence of a deity. Uh, you can place people like William Lane Craig in, uh, in here, where like when he wrote Reasonable Faith, for instance, in defense of natural theology. And then you have another camp in which they're arguing for the social utility of religion, in which uh, society ultimately is better off with religion. It's a good lubricant for making sure that society progresses uh, relatively well and that the number of social ills in society are minimized as much as possible. They really kind of just view religion, or I mean, at, at the very least, they write as if they view religion as just a means to make sure that society is properly functioning. And I would say that Soul Boom pretty much fits into that latter camp. And even though I'm not a believer myself, I, I do enjoy reading about this sort of stuff. I, I, I like reading about religion and religious apologetics. Uh, I, I majored, one of, my, one of my majors was in religious studies, because it is something that I genuinely find fascinating. Uh, but it is frustrating when I do read these books, and all they're pretty much doing is arguing for the social utility of religion, and using that almost as a proxy for arguing why God does exist. I can understand why some people would make the argument that uh, because religion is socially useful and it does work, that in and of itself is a good argument for the existence of God. Sure, by all means, make that argument, but that's certainly not an argument made in most of the books I've read, and it's most certainly not an argument made in what may very well be, even though he seems like a nice guy, um, one of the most incoherent books I've ever read. This book is the live, laugh, love of religion. It is an incoherent mess that is as vacuous as it is wishy-washy. From misunderstanding Occam's razor and scientific reasoning to frustratingly vague and empty platitudes, Wilson manages to spout so many words onto paper without actually saying anything. Wilson complains about the hippie spiritual people that cherry pick the parts of religion that they like, while simultaneously doing the same exact thing. Wilson fails to come up with a good definition of religion, and he also fails to defend his idea that the reason why we have so many social ills in society is because we veered off from this definition of religion. I can't stress this enough, but this book is the live, laugh, love of religious apologetics. Uh, in this video, I'm going to be doing a lot of granting towards a lot of Rain's arguments, uh, because a lot of his arguments are contingent on previous propositions that I, I don't think are sound. But even if they are, I, I still think his conclusions are poorly thought out. To briefly state the main argument of the book, and, and don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll fully flesh out the argument as the video progresses, but uh, Rain ultimately believes, and he argues, that the reason why we have so many ills in society, like social injustice issues and climate change, is because we veered off away from spirituality, from religion. He believes that there are a lot of things that we can learn from a, from a religious and a spiritual perspective that will help us in alleviating many of the issues that we see in society. So in and of itself, this is a daunting task that Rain is embarking on. And I would apply the same level of caution to practitioners on the other side, the, the new atheists, for example, uh, who argue that society is actually worse off with religion. 
So you should be able to defend your claims, your arguments with, with, with data, with good rhetoric, whatever it may be. You should be able to put up a fight. And the problem with Rain Wilson is that he puts up a very, very, very little fight. And I have to say, it does seem like it's because of a lack of trying. Have you ever read or heard anyone say something opinionated uh, that you immediately thought of 10 possible counterexamples to their claim? That's basically this book in a nutshell, really. Rain makes a lot of claims that he fails to substantiate in more than two sentences or a paragraph. And he also fails to address obvious counterexamples to a lot of his points. And he does this so often to the point where it really just comes across as him not having done his homework. Let me give you an example. One of the claims that Rain makes, that a lot of people make really, is that uh, religious people donate more to charity, so therefore this is a positive aspect of religion, and one of the reasons why we should consider going back to being religious or spiritual or whatever. And studies and polls have shown that religious people do tend to donate more to charity. They, they tend to be more charitable. But there are some obvious counterexamples to this, counterexamples that have been brought up numerous times. For example, one could very easily argue that this has less to do with religion as it has to do with community, with groups. It's not the religion part, the religious, the metaphysical, the belief part that makes people donate more to charity. It's just being in a communal group, a communal group that values uh, donating to the poor. As Phil Zuckerman, professor of sociology and secular studies argues in his book, What It Means to Be Moral, this charitable tendency has less to do with religion than with communal gatherings. Religious people who didn't attend church didn't actually donate more themselves. And there are counter arguments to this as well. You could say, yeah, sure, but the catalyzing enzyme is ultimately going to be religion, uh, where you have a group of secular people versus a group of religious people. The religious group will always donate more on average than the secular group of people because the religion, those beliefs that come from Christianity or Islam, that's the catalyzing enzyme that makes them want to actually donate to charity. In other words, religion is the best tool at incentivizing people to donate to charity, more so than any humanistic philosophy. And even if that's true, and I I'm inclined to think that it is, you still have to have that deeper conversation about the trade-offs, about whether or not this increase in charitable tendencies outweigh the negative baggage that comes from the other aspects of religion. Like, hey, what about their weird views on, on homosexuality? Or what about their weird allergic reaction to shellfish? Uh, you have to have that conversation. And that conversation seems to be a few levels too deep for Rain Wilson. And that's not that this is a deep conversation that only esoteric philosophers are having. These are very, very common counterpoints to the claims that Rain is making. And by not addressing them or, you know, glossing over them very briefly, it just comes across as him not having done his homework. So this is basically what seems to happen in the book. Rain argues positively for the existence of religion. He says, well, these are the good things that come from religion, and here's, these are the social issues in society that would be solved by going back to religion. And then people would obviously think to themselves, uh, well, what about the bad parts of religion? And then Rain goes on to describe what he means by religion and what he means by spirituality, and it very conveniently ignores the bad parts of religion. Remember when I said that Rain complains about the hippie spirituals that cherry pick the parts of religion that they like? Well, this is where Rain Wilson does exactly the same thing. And I'm not saying that Rain Wilson needs to address every single counterpoint to the claims that he makes. Obviously, that's not possible and it's not reasonable. You can discuss only a handful of topics while still providing insightful and concise information. You don't have to have this ginormous and dense book in order to justify the claims that you're making. Look at this book written by Graham Oppie, a seasoned academic and philosopher. You can tell that it's pretty short. It's not very long but it's insightful and it's concise. Compare that to this book written by Deepak Chopra, a self-proclaimed spiritual gangster who hilariously called Donald Trump retarded. But in Rain's book, there's just a clear lack of care in what he writes and in how he conveys what he believes. It's just not there in terms of any intellectual rigor. And I know that makes me come across as pretentious, but there's really no other way I can say it. This book is empty. Rain uses very broad words and all-encompassing language justify what he's saying and to convince people to move over to his side and he ends up just coming across as another Deepak Chopra. By the way, there's this a very fun game. For those of you who don't know who Deepak Chopra is, uh, he, he's basically this self-help guru who has been criticized for misusing the English language, misusing uh, particularly terms in physics, 
And he basically, I'm sure, is just a, a charlatan and a grifter and another Gwyneth Paltrow, but from a different country. And there's this game where you have to determine whether or not what you read on the screen is from Deepak Chopra or if it's, if it's like, I don't know if it's AI, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's fun. It's, it, it just goes to show you how empty uh, this type of rhetoric really is. And it, concerningly also how alluring it can be and how many people flock to someone who can speak like this, even though they're not saying anything. Oh, but okay, I'm sure a lot of people are now wondering, how does Rain Wilson define religion? How does he define spirituality? Because that's going to be the key ingredient in terms of whether or not this is a convincing book. A Rain rightfully recognizes that these words can be defined very differently by people of different intellectual and cultural persuasions. Uh, however, he lists a set of beliefs that he believes most religious adherents ascribe to. These are beliefs that provide positive structure and change to society and are unique to religious thought and all can be viewed as unique pathways leading to the same ultimate truth. He ultimately describes a set of beliefs that incorporate the transcendental, community, purpose, devotion, and service. Specifically, the religious or spiritual person is one who believes in these 10 things. Number one, a higher power a belief in something or someone bigger than creation and who is beyond all comprehension. Uh, this allegedly gives us a sense of community. Number two, life after death. The death of our physical vessel is not the end of our life. There is something more than just material within us. So right here, this goes back to one of my criticisms about the book in which he's clearly saying that the materialistic philosophy that a lot of people adopt, that a lot of atheists adopt, is not a good one but he doesn't defend this anywhere. He doesn't defend why this materialistic interpretation of reality is a bad interpretation, or at the very least, not as good as a, a religious interpretation. Number three, the power of prayer. All religions have some version of prayer that is sacred and often mysterious. Throughout the book, he describes some aspects of religion as mysterious, and often it kind of just comes across as him doing it in order to inoculate it from criticism which is something that a lot of religious people do. Number four, transcendence. We rise above our materialistic desires and values and arrive at some higher level of thought. Number five, community, the cornerstone of much religious thought. Number six, a moral compass, a higher sense of right and wrong, a list of shared values that are universal and timeless. I wish he delved into this part a little more because I think it's definitely interesting. Rain Wilson, if you read the book, obviously, but also if you listen to what he's had to say um, outside of his television shows and movies, he's a very, I don't like using this term and I don't like using, you know, words like woke or, or anything, but you, you guys know what I mean when I say them. He's definitely on that side of the political spectrum. He's certainly very left. He's certainly woke. Um, and so people on that side, people on his team, tend to be very morally relativistic in terms of judging other cultures, judging other people, saying that, well, that group of people, we can't judge them using our, our, our ethical framework because they have a different one. And we can't, uh, we can't epistemologically justify us being above them. And obviously there's a much uh, bigger philosophical debate there, but generally speaking, people on his side tend to adopt that view. And the people who adopt the opposite view people who are much more objective in terms of their ethical frameworks uh, tend to be religious people, tend to be people who are the ones that I would expect Rain Wilson doesn't like. So it's interesting to see that juxtaposition of his religiosity and his view on ethics and universal ethics, while also adopting very much the social attitudes of uh, Hollywood, the far left. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to say it. But yeah, I just wish he delved more into this. I think it would have been a, a, a very, very interesting um, a very interesting look into how he thinks. Number seven, the force of love, unconditional love for ourselves, our human brothers and sisters, and God. Number eight, increased compassion, or the golden rule, basically. Number nine, service to the poor, altruism is key. And number 10, a strong sense of purpose. Religions give us a personal reason to exist, as well as a greater, loftier collective goal. I agree that we should adopt many of these precepts in order to have a healthy and vibrant society. I think we should be communal. I, I do think that we should have a set of shared values that are humanitarian in nature. This coincides with having a deeper sense of love and compassion for our fellow apes. We should be more altruistic and care about the poor. We should also have a strong sense of purpose. It's this lack of purpose 
that drives a lot of young men towards radical groups. And to Rain's credit, he isn't arguing that we must adhere to a specific religion. Rather, he argues that many values found within the dominant religious sects are ones that we have abandoned at our own peril. In his words, we have thrown out the good of spirituality with the bad of religion. But again, this goes back to what I was saying about my frustration with these types of books when they argue for the social utility of religion, is that when you say things like, uh, we can't throw out the good of spirituality without the bad of religion, what exactly does that mean? To a lot of people like Ryan Wilson, the bad of religion really just seems to mean the parts of religion that you don't like because of your contemporary moral framework. I, I forget who said it, it might have been Sam Harris, I don't know, but it really is a good point and it really drives home, I think, just how wishy-washy this interpretation of religion is. There's a creeping sense of only narrowly looking at the social utility of religion and seeing that as good enough as a reason to argue for its existence. And much like other books of this ilk, Rain doesn't really go into detail in terms of what the bad of religion is and why we're throwing it out. If you're reading the Old Testament, if you're reading Leviticus or Deuteronomy, you find something you don't like. Let's say you don't like the passage where it says about how if you lay with a man in the same way that you would lay with a woman, it's an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. You have to explain why that part is bad and why it should be thrown out. And you can't explain that or do that by using the language or using the belief system of contemporary social justice. You can't. If you're going to argue that religion is good, and let's say, not that Rain Wilson is doing this, but other people argue that Christianity is good, you have to look at that passage and argue why it's a passage that we should ignore in contemporary society, not using the contemporary social zeitgeist. You have to use the ethical framework that is given to you within religion in order to refute the parts that you don't like. And if you're not going to refute them, I know that's going to be a strong word, you have to at the very least argue why it was okay to write that at that time or come up with a logical reason of why it was largely misinterpreted. You have to do it within the context of the book. But what Rain does and what a lot of these other uh, people do who are very soft on Christianity, who are very soft on religion, is that they'll look at passages that are not good and they'll either brush over them, they'll not really mention them, or they'll fail to recognize, they'll completely fail to recognize that the only reason why you recognize that that is a bad passage in the Bible is not by virtue of you becoming more religious and understanding religion even better, understanding your religion even better. Your views on homosexuality and why it's okay has not come about from religion. It's not come about from reading even further the Bible or the Quran. It's come about from secularism. And there is a second problem that people like Rain often encounter here. And of course, it's left unaddressed. Let's say we do recognize that society ultimately is better off with religion. How do you force a group of people to believe something that they genuinely don't believe? I can tell myself all I want, and I know people like Sam Harris have made similar arguments to this, so uh, don't criticize me for copying someone's argument. I, I think it's good, and I think it rings true, and I haven't seen anyone properly refute it. But I can tell myself over and over and over again that uh, the tooth fairy exists or whatever. I know this is going to sound very cringy, old school atheist, but just like I think it just drives home the point. I can convince myself of a falsehood or try to as much as I possibly can. But if I genuinely believe that it is false, there is nothing that I can do to be able to convince myself otherwise. How can we do that with society? If we know so much about philosophy, about science, about religion, about history, you cannot convince a group of people that intellectually speaking don't think God exists you cannot force them to believe that he exists just because it's useful. You can argue that there are some that, you know, it's better if you do act as if you believe in a religious God. It's better as if you act as if you're Christian. But by definition, once you do that, by definition, you are not adopting the religious mindset of complete adherence. You are intellectually, logically, rationally analyzing what makes a better society, and you are using reason to make a better society. You are not using religion, you are not using spirituality, and you are not using your book. If anything, you're using manipulation. And let's say someone says, yeah, you can look at the values that come from religion and recognize that if we adopt those values, we would live a better society. But it's only by truly believing in the Christian God, it's only by truly being religious 
that those values can be fully invoked. Well, guess what? We live in a world in which we can't force people to believe things that they genuinely don't. So we have to go to plan B. If literally believing in specific religious claims and tenets are the only ways to achieve the level of social cohesion that Rain is advocating for, then we have a serious problem on our hands. But that's a big if. Rain must first successfully argue that this even is the case in order for us to seriously debate this point. And Rain consistently fails to do so. Where Rain fails most in is causally linking these religious and spiritual values to the degradation of society. Let's take a look at some of the issues in society that we are forced to deal with because of a lack of religion and spirituality. So let's start with some common ones. So we have drug addiction, suicide, anxiety and depression, loneliness, social media, and there's a well-known and combative debate about whether the drop in religious values has led to an increase in these issues. And while Rain does provide some defense of the claims that he makes here, it's nothing in-depth or seriously noteworthy. He cites Pew Research that shows that the gap between happiness in Christian versus non-religious communities uh, is steep. It's 36% of U.S. Christians reporting being very happy compared to 25% of unaffiliated respondents. The obvious concern here would be the reliability of self-reporting as well as the differences in psychology. If you're a Christian and you believe that you should be happier because you're Christian, you'll over-report your happiness. It's similar to how a women could publicly say that they enjoy living in a patriarchal society in Saudi Arabia because they can't really say otherwise. Another problem could just be the high number of confounding variables. Uh, sure, Christians are happier than atheists on average, but is it the atheism specifically? What about other demographic variables? This is such a messy sociological question that it's criminal to just brush it over. It's also only linked to the United States. What about the Scandinavian countries that are famously secular and higher functioning than the United States in most metrics? According to Rain, it's clear from the science that something about religion is clearly working. Is it only according to the science if it agrees with you though? What about the fact that countries with the highest rates of belief in God have the highest rates of violence? Is that also evidence that something about religion isn't working? Or are those things not really real religion? Or am I missing a lot of context in terms of that statistic? The point is that we can go on and on about statistics. It is a very complex topic that Rain seems to have no knowledge of and is perfectly content giving out one or two statistics and calling it a day. But this isn't even the most interesting part. The most interesting claim and the reason I bought the freaking book was because of his connection between the drop of religion and spirituality and the rise in racism, sexism, materialism, unjust economic extremes, nationalism, militarism, and climate change. So I get the materialism one. I brought that up previously. I won't delve deeper into that one. Uh, but what about the other ones? Uh, what exactly is the connection there? Let's, so let's read what he's actually writing. Let's actually read the book. When you stop and deeply consider these insidious pandemics of injustice, disease, and imbalance, you start to see the connections between them and make it much more difficult to examine them individually. Climate change is intricately connected to greed and its resulting materialism, which eats away at most every culture in the world. Greed is connected to selfishness, which is a vice that lies behind, beneath, and around the economic injustices that dovetail into racism and sexism. Selfishness also links up with the narcissism and ego that fuels militarism and nationalism and contributes to the alienation that triggers loneliness and mental health struggles, which are made worse by materialism, bringing us right back to where we started. So I'm not really sure where to begin here. He, he just, he, he daisy chains his way into bringing conversations about climate change income inequality, racism, and nationalism back to spiritualism. Uh, on the face of it, it looks pretty silly. It's a prime example of mental gymnastics at play, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's, let's take a look at the first connection. Climate change is intricately connected to greed and its resulting materialism, which eats away at most every culture in the world. Uh, I want to make it perfectly clear that Rain doesn't go into sufficient detail in substantiating his claims. So this paragraph, I promise you, this paragraph is pretty much all we have in terms of understanding why he thinks this. He addresses this a bit towards the end of the book, but there isn't much more that he adds in defense of his thesis. 
So I'd wager that it's our unrelenting desire to have more things, um, more cars, more technology, more material things, that we fail to fully understand the consequences that is leading towards climate change. Uh, seems pretty understandable in terms of making the connection, but it's probably not the most accurate description of what's going on. It's very disingenuous to say that a large chunk of our desire to create things that are dangerous to the atmosphere come from greed, when many of these brilliant technological innovations have made living conditions astronomically better. Climate science has been evolving over time, and we're still learning more and more about how the climate functions. Yes, we can be doing a lot more, sure, but to very broadly label us as greedy because of our materialistic desires is just silly. It also feels very forced to label greed as the deciding reason in the first place. Why not stupidity? Well, greed, I guess, is a biblical vice, so uh, that really seems to be the deciding factor as to why he chose that. Uh, the fact of the matter is, we can do a lot better in terms of describing why climate change exists, rather than just saying it's because of greed. Uh, we can do much better. Now, the second part is between greed and selfishness. Greed is connected to selfishness, which is a vice that lies behind, beneath, and around the economic injustices that dovetail into racism and sexism. Uh, racism and sexism are potent forces because we're selfish. Uh, if we weren't selfish, we wouldn't have racism or sexism. There's a, a, a key word here that Rain is missing completely and that I think has much more explanatory power than these Sesame Street descriptions. Belief. True, genuine, raw belief. This is a powerful motivator for influencing human actions. I, I mean, isn't a drop in belief the reason why these things are big problems in society? Why are you not applying that same logic here? Maybe Rain read too much deconstructionist philosophy and binge read Richard Delgado or something and thinks that 100% of the social ills in the world has to do with white men wanting to maintain their power. Um, I don't know because he doesn't tell us. Uh, but if people genuinely believe through cultural osmosis and poor parenting that other races and or sexes are inherently inferior, I think this will play a much larger role in creating racist and sexist attitudes than selfishness. If Rain was in a classroom and the teacher asked her students why racism and sexism exist, Rain's answer, among all the other answers in the classroom of us being selfish, it, it probably won't spark too much of a serious discussion. Again, he's trying really hard to make a connection here. All right, so now let's look at the, the final connection. Selfishness also links up with the narcissism and ego that fuels militarism and nationalism and contributes to the alienation that triggers loneliness and mental health struggles, which are made worse by materialism, bringing us right back to where we started. I, I know some people out there might be thinking that I'm spending too much time picking apart this one paragraph in the entire book, but this is literally his thesis. And this is basically the only defense that exists in this book. The other chapters go into very generic values that can come about from religion, but there's never a direct actual like causal link between these religious values and the things that Rain Wilson is concerned about in society. This is a huge problem throughout Rain's book. It's very easy to come up with counterexamples and objections to his claims because he doesn't take the time to flesh out his arguments. Very rarely will he provide a counter argument that actually feels like he's done research on the opposition. But more often than not, you're left with very unsatisfactory arguments that make it seem as if Rain hasn't really done his research on ideas that he disagrees with. In the words of Christopher Hitchens, Shirley, Rain Wilson's favorite public intellectual, but you, you give me the awful impression, of, I hate to have to say it, of someone who hasn't read any of the arguments against your position ever. 